This is WYXR FM Memphis 91.7, powered by the Crosstown Radio Partnership between Crosstown Concourse, the Daily Memphian, and the University of Memphis. Hear us online at wyxr.org, on TuneIn, or on your favorite assistant. Just ask for WYXR. <laughs> This is Good Morning. This is Bishop Phoebe Rofe of the Episcopal Diocese of West Tennessee, and welcome to Faithfully Memphis. Each Thursday morning, I have an opportunity to interview uh, an interesting person uh, to learn more about what they're doing and the role of faith in their life. So we start the show each week with a saint of the day. This is a way for you to learn a little bit about the ordinary men and women throughout the ages who have done extraordinary things through the power of God. And so this week we will be celebrating John of Damascus, who was a Christian monk and priest who lived in the 7th century. John was the son of a Christian government official for the Muslim caliph in Damascus, and he was actually ordained as a priest in the year 726. He is known primarily as a father of the Eastern Orthodox Church and for his defense of icons. So an icon is um, a beautiful work of art that is hand-painted. There are uh, specific colors and practices associated with writing an icon. I said it was painted, but I believe the correct term is that you write an icon. And icons are not to be worshipped in and of themselves, but are uh, pieces of art that allow you to draw in to a deeper sense of God and your relationship with God. So there was um, a movement in the early 8th century called iconoclasm. And it was opposed to the veneration or the worship of icons. And um, the Byzantine emperor at that point ordered the destruction of all icons. So John wrote three apologies or treatises in defense of holy images, arguing that these images were not idols because they didn't represent God. Um, And he argued that you can respect anything that's in nature or created by human beings. That's different from the worship that should only be given to God alone. Um, And so the, the fact that John wrote and argued forcefully uh, in this way, led the Seventh Ecumenical Council in the year 787 to decree that not only icons, but also crosses, the books of the Gospels, and other sacred objects were to receive reverence or veneration. So that is uh, one of the things that John of Damascus is known for. He also wrote a number of hymns of the church that we still use in the Episcopal Church today. And there's also um, a legend about John that we can't confirm completely, but as, uh, as history reports, Leo III sent some forged documents uh, which implicated John in a plot to attack 
Damascus, and the caliph was upset at the thought of John's possible betrayal, and he ordered John's right hand to be cut off and hung in public view to be publicly displayed. So a couple of days later, John asked for his hand, and he prayed uh, before an icon of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and legend has it that his hand was miraculously restored. So we don't know if that story is true, but that is one of the stories that is told about John of Damascus. He died in the year 749 and is now recognized as a saint. In fact, in the year 1890, he was also declared a doctor of the church by Pope Leo XIII. So I will read the prayer that is assigned for John of Damascus. Confirm our minds, O Lord, in the mysteries of the true faith, set forth with power by your servant John of Damascus, that we with him, confessing Jesus to be true God and true man, and singing the praises of the risen Lord, may by the power of the resurrection attain to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
So that hymn was Sleepers Awake, and uh, I selected that hymn because it is a hymn of Advent, and we are in the season of Advent, a season of waiting and preparation and anticipation for God coming among us in human form at Christmas. So today, I am happy to have in the studio with me a special guest, Alexa Bambrick. She is the Director of Development for LifeDoc Health, and she's been in Memphis for over six years with her family, uh, as recently joined LifeDoc. And so, Alexa, thank you very much for being present with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your background? For example, where did you grow up? Absolutely. I um, am a Texas native, but I moved to Mississippi with my family my senior year of high school. Um, I was in Starkville, Mississippi. I did my undergrad at Mississippi University for Women in Columbus and um, moved to Jackson, Mississippi after. About six years ago, I came up to Memphis. I worked in hospitality management, managing restaurants, and um, came up here to manage a restaurant and then later open a restaurant with another group of uh, restaurant owners and um, really loved that career path. I really, really loved that as an introduction into the Memphis community. I got to know so many wonderful people and it's such a a unique way to um, serve our community here. Um, a few years ago, I decided, though, to make the transition into nonprofit development and take that skill set that I had uh, developed over years in the hospitality industry and to fundraising. Wow. So can you tell us a little bit about LifeDoc Health? So what is the mission of this organization? Why was it started? Yeah, so LifeDoc Health um, opened over 15 years ago now. Uh, They originally started as a primary health care clinic, but they have a very unique model in that they are constantly growing and adjusting their services um, to best fit the needs of their patients. So they're always looking at ways that they can best partner to support the health of the people that they serve. Uh, 15 years ago when they opened, they were a primary care clinic, but quickly grew to um, add endocrinologists, cardiologists, a pharmacy, uh, behavioral health specialists. It was basically has become a one-stop shop for anybody who needs their services so that it um, reduces barriers to care for those who may not have time to be referred to a bunch of different specialists. They're now able to come into LifeDoc, see their PCP, and then... Um, based on recommendations where they need additional services, they can be referred in-house and get to do everything that they need to support their house or health in one stop. Got it. So is there a specific, particular target population in terms of the patients at LifeDoc, the people you serve? Yeah, so right now um, our clinics are located in two places. We've got uh, both of them in East Memphis. We um, recently transitioned into a nonprofit, though. So this has historically been a for-profit business. Um, We've always welcomed and served everybody regardless of um, income or insurance status. We even have a subscription program for um, discounted health care services. So we really try to make it accessible to everybody. But in, um, in doing so, we've become a lot more critical about looking at how we can expand accessibility. This is where the um, nonprofit comes into play. Our nonprofit's mission is creating um, effective solutions to empower communities and improve health. So what we're doing now is taking all of this data that they have stored over the last 15 years about how to adjust and pivot those services to be most effective in supporting people's health. We're actually moving those into the communities of medically underserved people. So we have um, identified with the help of TenCare the 11 most medically underserved communities in Memphis, and we've now targeted five of those communities to launch our nonprofit programs. So um, in doing this, we are hoping to become even more expansive in serving anybody and everybody who needs it. 
we've got a variety of programs that we're launching through this nonprofit, including five satellite locations. This is um, specifically to address the barrier of um, lack of proximity to care. You know, not only are we looking at people who have transportation barriers and um, barriers to care, such as like lack of time off or, um, you know, just, just not being able to get there. But we also have people in these communities who, even if they, they want to see a doctor, there's not necessarily somebody that is within their proximity, someone that they can travel to. So we're looking to uh, relieve that need by putting additional clinics into these communities. Uh, we're also integrating into schools. We've partnered with Green Dot Public Schools. Um, we are currently in two of their schools. When um, schools return in session, we'll be in five of their schools. We have a uh, really, really cool program that LifeDoc launched in October of 2019 called Wave of Health. Wave of Health is a uh, nutrition-based initiative. So through Wave of Health, we're hosting um, once a month events with uh, the support of Mid-South Food Bank, who's providing 40 to 50 pounds of um, nutritional groceries. And when the students and their families come pick this up, they're getting to meet with LifeDoc Health. They're uh, receiving health screenings that can address risk factors for um, conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, other cardiometabolic issues. But they're also being connected to our care coordinators. So in this visit, they're getting um, you know, a health assessment, they're getting connected to educational resources, they're learning, you know, just general awareness about their health, but they're also re going to receive that follow-up. It's the first step in continuity to care for people who may have never seen a primary care physician, where they will um, be followed up with and they'll have the support, the added support that they may have not had before in getting connected to care, and not just at LifeDoc, but helping them find their own primary care providers, especially, you know, if they're already on ten care and they already have resources in place, we just want to support them in being able to prioritize their health for the first time. Wow. So that's a lot. So um, the first thing that strikes me is it sounds like this is a, a preventative approach to health care. So maybe instead of waiting until someone is really sick, if they're getting basic information at the point that they're picking up food, you can catch things early. Yes, our goal is all about preventative health care. Um, the entire concept of this practice and the way that Dr. Velasquez has grown his practice to be so comprehensive is really taking a holistic approach with people mm -hmm. and recognizing that um, it's better to teach people and support people in being healthy than it is to wait for people to get sick and address the issues at that point. So mm -hmm. everything about LifeDoc Health as a nonprofit is about integrating into communities who need us the most to provide that preventative care and those educational and supportive resources such as nutritional food um, to help Memphis be healthier. Yeah. The other thing is, uh, and this is an issue that I know my congregations deal with, the church deals with, there are two models. You can either have a great program, whether it's secular or religious, and wait for people to come to you, or you can choose to go and be where people already are. And it sounds like this model is one where you all are not just sitting back and waiting for people to make an appointment. You're looking for organic ways to connect with members of the community in a place where they're already safe, maybe, and feel comfortable to expose them to wonderful information. Absolutely. Um, and that's exactly why we're taking unique approaches where what Dr. Velasquez and his team have done is, you know, they, they've spent 15 years in their clinic developing these really creative and effective solutions to helping people become healthier and helping people prevent preventable illnesses. Mm -hmm. But now, as a nonprofit, we're taking all of that information that they've learned and all of these proven successful uh, models to care, and we're pivoting that into the communities um, and not in just a build it and they will come way, like you're saying, but in ways that meet realistic needs mm -hmm. for these people. In addition to our Wave of Health program, we're also um, 
part using that partnership with Green Dot Health to employ full time nurses into Green Dot Public Schools, um, and through this, you know, students are going to be able to receive more consistent health care. But as these nurses become established in their schools, we'll be able to integrate Wave of Health throughout the month, so mm-hmm. that it's no longer just a once a month event, but is something that's ongoing where these families have continual access to our health care support um, through these nurses and these nurses can facilitate the food pantry all month long mm-hmm. to increase accessibility. The other really cool program that we're looking to launch this year is our Healthy Prepared Meals Initiative. So there's been a lot of research done inside of LifeDoc about food insecurity and how to address food insecurity in a preventative healthcare way. Um, and what we have determined is that a lot of the people that are living with food insecurity and are living in food deserts are very open and would love the opportunity to access prepared healthy meals at an affordable price. Um, There's just not the access yet. So we've come up with the solution to partner with other chefs and uh, rent a commercial kitchen, start preparing basically a a meal subscription program a delivery meal subscription program will have different pickup points as well in these communities um but we're going to start providing prepared take and bake take and reheat Mm -hmm. meals um for only 3.99 a meal um which is very very exciting and we're really looking forward to being able to further integrate our preventative health care services in that way because again it's meeting a need that we we know exists Mm -hmm. and that we know can have a real impact on someone's ability to live healthy. Um, So LifeDoc Health is not just about providing those clinical services. It's really about addressing needs holistically and making sure that we are there to support the overall health and well-being. Wow. So basically for the same amount that you would pay for a fast food meal, if you're a mother working a couple of jobs, juggling a lot of things, you can get a healthy, nutritious, pre-prepared meal that you just slip into the oven or maybe even the microwave. Yes, it's very exciting. Um, you know, I think w- there are so many things that inspired me to join the LifeDoc Health team. One of the, the most inspiring things was meeting with Dr. Velasquez and hearing specifically about how his faith has really impacted the trajectory of his entire career. Um, You know, Dr. Velasquez came to Memphis because his oldest son, or second oldest son, Pedro Jr., was a patient at St. Jude. And um, during their time there, that was their introduction into Memphis. That was where they learned what Memphis is all about, and they really got to see how our Memphis community rallies around people who need their help. Um, And it was faith that got them through that and the immense gratitude that Dr. Velasquez has or and continues to have for St. Jude and for Memphis. He utilized that opportunity to uh, and his skill set as this amazing, talented doctor to really invest his life's work into giving back to the community through Life Doc Health. So, um, you know, over all of these years, the goal has always been to give back to Memphis and to give other people the opportunity that the Velasquez family had through being treated at St. Jude. And it's very exciting that uh, LifeDoc has come to this point in its lifespan where it's now being given back to the community. After many, many years of having a for-profit medical model, Um, They've been able to establish all of these solutions. They've been able to perfect a lot of these practices. And now it's being given back to Memphis. Wow, that's an amazing story. So, of course, the name of this show is Faithfully Memphis. (laughs) And that's a great segue hearing about Dr. Velasquez's faith and the role that it played. I wonder, as part of your comprehensive preventative offerings, is there anything that has a spiritual component or that deals with people's sort of psychological, emotional, spiritual lives? Yes. So we offer behavioral health services as a part of our comprehensive care model, which I think is fantastic. Um, it's so great to know that that when you come to LifeDoc, 
you have uh, somebody looking out for that. You know, any mental health barriers that people are experiencing or any any depression or, um, you know, other co-occurring disorders that can happen when coming to terms with chronic illnesses, there's something put into place for that. We have support there in-house. But a story that I heard that I really love and I think really encompasses um, the culture of Life Doc Health is that Dr. Velasquez, when he sees these patients and he's preparing their prescriptions, he always writes a prescription for faith. He always wants to make sure that everybody knows, you know, go get your meds from the pharmacy, go do this, make sure that you're following your treatment plan, make sure that you know you can contact us for support, but also don't forget that faith is a piece of all of this. Have faith, we have faith, and we're here to support you. Wow, I've never heard of a prescription for faith, but I really (laughs) love that concept. So I wonder, Alexa, we're in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. It's had such a, a major impact on all aspects of how we live together in community. What are some of the ways that COVID-19 has impacted the work of Life Health? It's, uh, it has been a big year. You know, I think that uh, pivot is the word for 2020. Everybody has had to get creative about finding solutions um, for us. It has been, you know, continuing to to show up for these people and making sure that, um, you know, even with school closures, with Wave of Health not being able to physically be there to provide screenings for students anymore, we've continued our partnership with Mid-South Food Bank to make sure that um, while we can't be in the schools, Mid-South Food Bank is still there providing that food. So despite the um, difficulties that we've run into with COVID, we've been able to work with our community partners to ensure that those needs are still being met. Um, In general, just really focusing on the overarching health and wellness of our um, patients and ensuring that we are continuing to support them through this time and continuing our aggressive follow-up policies to make sure that they know that we're still here despite COVID, that we're still checking in on their health and that we want to do anything that we can to support them has been really critical to um, keeping our patients engaged and feeling supported throughout Mm -hmm. this year. Yeah, it's definitely been a tough year on everybody. But as you think about people who are the most vulnerable, they have borne the brunt of all of this, I think, in a disproportionate way. Absolutely. Yeah. So is there a sense that, you know, five or or 10 years or whatever, do you have a sense of the long-term goal of Dr. Velasquez and the the team at Life Health? Like, what is the ultimate goal in all of this? Well, the ultimate goal um, not only is to create a healthier Memphis, but actually to become a reference model for other cities to be able to do what we're doing. they are amazing with data and research and tracking everything that happens here and adjusting their services specific to the hard data that they are recording to figure out what is really going to be most effective in making an impact on the health of people. Um, Through this, we want to become a reference model. We want to take all of the research that we have put into this and really establish ourselves in a way that um, isn't specific to supporting life doc health. This isn't about creating healthier Memphians that will continue to come see us at life doc health. It's about supporting Memphis as a whole to make people healthier, to empower people, to reduce barriers to care so that people actually can prioritize their health because that's a privilege that so many don't have. Um, but as we do this, we want to continue really tracking these outcomes and really continuing to um, have that robust data that we can share with other organizations who are interested in trying to do something this way as well. That way we can um, not only grow to be a healthier Memphis, but a healthier Tennessee and you know, continue that model nationally. Wow, that's really great. Yeah, I think um, good health is something we probably all take for granted until something happens and we're having some sort of physical ailment but just day in and day out we may not even think a lot about our health 
Right. And not only that, you know, I mean, we take it for granted. And, and of course, we have um, many people who aren't even able to entertain the conversation of prioritizing their health. Right. Um, but there's also just a lot of being unaware. You know, many people who have ten care have have never actually gone to see a primary care physician. They don't know what they don't know. They are worried about keeping their lights on. They're worried about getting their kids to school. They're worried about the daily grind of responsibilities that it it's too far reaching for them to even think about prioritizing their health. And for that reason, many people are living with chronic illnesses who don't even know. Um, so a, a huge piece of us moving into these medically underserved communities is to empower people through education. And with these screenings, they can learn about their health, perhaps for the first time. Um, but that's where our care connectors become so critical in all of this, because most of these medically underserved communities, we're seeing a lot of people who already have 10 care. This isn't even necessarily um, an uninsured issue. It's not a cost issue. It's people just not having access and not having the resources to know what they need. So, um, you know, doing these screenings and then getting them connected to this follow up is where we really think that we're going to see a huge shift in people being able to prioritize their health. Yeah. So I wonder, and I don't, I don't have enough knowledge to know the answer to this, but if a lot of folks in this area who already have 10 care are aware, become aware of health needs that they have and start making appointments, I wonder about the capacity of physicians currently to take new patients. You know, I'm, I'm wondering if that will lead to maybe the 10 care network having to rethink how it is structured and, and does business. Have you all thought about that, that if you actually increase the demand, that could have an implication? Yeah, you know, we actually, when we were determining where we were going to pilot these programs, we worked with 10 Care um, to look at the map that they had developed of the 11 most medically underserved communities. That was determined based on where we see the highest number of people who have 10 Care that are not using it. So all of these people who have 10 care, they are assigned physicians. They, they do have primary care providers that they're connected with at the time they get on 10 care. However, they don't necessarily have a means to get to that person. Um, it, there are so many different variables that go into them not actually being able to connect with their PCP. And that's why part of our solution is to launch these satellite clinics. Um, we are looking to launch five within the next um, three years, and that's going to be um, Whitehaven is our first location. We're looking at locations in um, North Memphis, South Memphis, Orange Mound, Nutbush. But as we continue to grow, we want to continue to meet that need um, you know, by further expanding our clinics, but also getting these nurses into our uh, schools and then utilizing our nurse practitioners at LifeDoc Health to oversee these nurses and come through to do the well exams. We're really looking to um, extend these services in a way that overlap with different aspects of people's lives. Got it. So maybe even there could be the opportunity to, for more people to go into nurse practitioners or whatever if there is a demand that could even create employment for some folks wouldn't that be amazing it would be amazing <laughs> so if um, people were interested in learning more or even volunteering as you roll out this program do you anticipate that there will be volunteer opportunities absolutely i am so excited to start getting volunteers involved um we have so many unique opportunities, especially with our Healthy Prepared Meals initiative while we're trying to, um, while still in the planning process, trying to figure out what that delivery model is going to look like. Um, you know, working with food distribution and um, even in our commercial kitchen when we're working to prepare these meals, I think that there's going to be a lot of really unique opportunities for volunteers to get involved and in my opinion, and, and maybe I'm biased because I come from the food industry, but I don't think that there's any 
better way to connect with other um, people in community service than over food. Yep, that's very spiritual. (laughs) Jesus regularly broke bread with people from all backgrounds, all walks of life. Well, Alexa, this has been a wonderful conversation. And as we sort of draw to a close, I wonder um, what is giving you a sense of hope? You know, we're in a season of various pandemics and lots of negative things if we choose to dwell on them. So what are you excited about? I can hear the enthusiasm in your voice. So what is it that's keeping you hopeful and upbeat? You know, I've been in Memphis for six years, and I always say that um, I, I stayed, I planted my roots here because Memphis is a city of hope. I um, am so constantly inspired just by the sense of community here and the um, overwhelming amount of helpers that we have in this city. People are so invested in creating better lives and better communities here in Memphis. Um, As I've transitioned into nonprofit over the past few years, I am so constantly humbled by the opportunity just to engage with the people doing so much of this work. Um, I think that a lot of my hope comes from other community members and from just the opportunity to even share space with some of these people. It's, it's inspiring. Um, and it really keeps me motivated with that boots on the ground mentality of just wanting to roll my sleeves up, get my hands dirty and, and really do some great work with other people here in Memphis. Well, thanks so much. And we certainly want to wish, um, life doc health, all the success as you all move forward Uh, And thanks for being part of Faithfully Memphis this morning. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed being here.
Soon and very soon we're going to see the King. That is another wonderful hymn from the season of Advent, uh, getting us excited about meeting uh, Christ in the form of a baby in just a few weeks. So this segment of the show is called Stump the Bishop. We get questions from not only Episcopalians, but even from other persons wanting to ask questions of a bishop. And we have some really good questions this week. So the first question has to do with the Advent wreath, which has four candles. And uh, while we're in the season of Christmas, which tends to be red and green, when you look at the candles on an Advent wreath, there are three purple candles and one pink candle. So why purple and pink instead of red and green? Well, the modern Advent wreath was actually created in 19th century Germany by a Lutheran pastor. And at the time, This Lutheran pastor was very involved with uh, the inner mission movement, promoting the development of social service organizations for the poor. So in the year 1839, uh, students at a school for poor boys in Hamburg, Germany, kept asking this pastor, when is Christmas going to be here? Right. That's such a common thing. Kids always want to know, when are we going to get there? And so uh, this pastor had a really ingenious idea. He took an old cartwheel and he laid it flat and he put um, some greenery around it and had four large white candles going around the circumference of that wheel with small red candles in between them. And the children would light a small candle each day, and then one of the larger white candles on each of the four Sundays of Advent so that they would know that by the time all of the candles were lit, it would be time to celebrate Christmas. So subsequent generations of German Christians simplified the design, just making wreaths that had four red candles. And then other Christian churches adapted the wreath for their own needs and their own understanding of the the season. We think that the original Lutheran pastor used red and white candles just because that was what was available. But later on, Roman Catholics were the ones who changed the red candles to be purple candles. And so purple is the color that is traditionally associated with uh, penance and Advent being a season of you considering the state of your own heart or your own mind. It's also purple in the season of Lent, which is a preparation for Easter. So three of the candles are purple and one is pink, which is the color of rejoicing. That even in a season where we're mindful of our own shortcomings and we're trying to improve ourselves, we always want to rejoice. In looking at this um, information about Advent wreaths, I learned that in Orthodox Christian churches, where Advent lasts for 40 days, uh, the wreath has six candles instead of four. There's a green candle representing faith, a blue candle representing hope, a gold candle representing love, a white candle representing peace, a purple candle representing penance, and a red candle representing communion. So that is why the Advent wreath candles are purple and pink instead of red and green. Another question that I received is, what is the origin of the service of lessons and carols that is typically conducted during the holiday season? Well, this service actually 
began in the year 1880. Uh, It was initiated by Bishop Edward Benson, who at that time was the Bishop of Truro in England. And on Christmas Eve in 1880, he was really concerned about the excessive consumption of alcohol in the bars and pubs during the holiday season. And he wanted to come up with an idea to get men out of these pubs and to get them into the real reason for the season to spend more time with their families, hopefully in the church. So he came up with this idea, and actually it was a priest serving with the bishop who came up with the idea of a service that consisted of wonderful Christmas music interspersed with Bible readings. So the readings that you would hear in a service of lessons and carols will tell the story of the fall of humanity, the promise of the Messiah, and the birth of Jesus. And there are nine Bible readings uh, that are typically involved in a service of lessons and carols. The other thing that I learned when I was doing the research is that until the 19th century, the singing of Christmas carols was normally performed when singers would visit people's homes. Christmas carols were considered to be secular music, and they had actually been, (coughs) excuse me, excluded from Christian worship. So I think the priest in putting together this service thought, if we can actually include some Christmas carols, maybe that would be something to attract people to come to church because they were not accustomed to hearing that sort of music in church. So the first service of Lessons and Carols on Christmas Eve in the year 1880 started at 10 p.m. and over 400 people showed up. Uh, So this is a service that initially began with the Church of England uh, and then spread throughout the whole Anglican Communion, and now, of course, churches of all denominations uh, have a service of lessons and carols. So perhaps this is something, if you have never participated in a service of lessons and carols, it will be easy to do so this year because many churches are going to offer the service virtually. So you could just Google it. Uh, I know there are several Episcopal churches in Memphis offering it. Uh, Sewanee, the University of the South, they're going to offer an online service of lessons and carols. So maybe this is something that you can add to your holiday tradition this year. The final question that I received um, is from a person who said, you know, the holiday season, they're hard. I tend to get depressed around the holidays. Is this normal? Actually, it is. If you think about it, when you look at commercials um, or Christmas cards uh, or some of these wonderful Christmas movies that we see on television, normally you see happy families and a wonderful table with lots of food a Christmas tree with lots of presents and everything is neatly resolved at the end of the lifetime movie about whatever Christmas spirit they're addressing. But in actuality, right, life is a lot more complicated than that. And so in the holiday season, when we are gathered with family and friends, first of all, this year, We won't be able to do that to the same extent. But even when we are able to do that, even in normal times, we're always reminded of the people who aren't there, the people who are missing from that family gathering. And then on top of that, not everybody is going to have a table full of food. Not everybody is going to have lots of presents under the tree. I remember my father, uh, who grew up in a large family in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and my grandparents um, 
were both uh, people who didn't have much formal education. And so because of that, they didn't make much money. My dad telling me that there were years when he and his eight brothers and sisters would get an orange each, one orange. So my grandparents could buy nine oranges for Christmas. And that was it. So, you know, when I think about that, and I can go into any store and buy as many oranges as I want, an orange is something that is a normal, everyday thing for me, but that an orange would be something special that he wouldn't normally get to have, and that would be the only thing that he received for Christmas. Um, The Christmas season can be tough for a lot of people. So I think it is normal, and the church has responded in part by creating uh, longest night services or blue services normally held between Thanksgiving and Christmas for families who have lost children or lost loved ones. But it is not unusual to have a sense of melancholy around the holiday season. So if you find yourself in that position, I really hope that you have a close family member or friend, someone that you can share those sentiments with, or think about things that do give you a sense of joy. Sometimes for me, that involves listening to music because music is something that can help lift my spirits. Sometimes that involves walking or just being outdoors and doing something physical. Sometimes if I volunteer to help other people, it means that I'm not so focused on myself that um, I miss the fact that I do have many blessings. So during the holiday season, if you do have periods where you're a little melancholy or a little depressed, That is normal. So reach out and find some support.
So thank you for joining us this week on Faithfully Memphis. Just a reminder that during this holiday season, as we're thinking about uh, the presents and the gifts that we want to give to our loved ones, first of all, I want to just encourage you to shop locally and to support local social enterprises that provide employment for our neighbors. And also to think maybe about um, instead of buying something, maybe you give a person the gift of time. So you agree to watch their kids or you agree to rake their yard or you agree to bake. There are lots of creative ways that we can give to others. So it doesn't always involve buying something. So now my brothers and sisters, until next week, Stay safe and stay positive.